So, Excellencies, uh, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, I should say, very welcome to the um, House of the, the Moderate Party and the Jarl Jarlsson Foundation. We're very pleased to see such a, such a mighty crowd appearing here today uh, for a discussion on a subject which is very, very important, uh, not only, of course, to, to Sweden, but for the European uh, family as a whole. And what we're going to talk about is the corruption which we can see inherit in many, unfortunately too many, of the institutions uh, which are, was established uh, at the end of the Second World War to uh, defend and promote the values uh, of human rights. But today we can see that these institutions are under attack, both from outside but more importantly from within. We can see signs and evidence of corruption and most notably in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe which gathers hundreds uh, of parliamentarians uh, every year for discussions upon human rights and upon abuses of human rights in the uh, member states uh, which have signed up to the uh, European Convention for the, de uh, for the Defense of, hum of, uh, of uh, Human Rights. And I have to say that uh, we feel very pleased, and here I can see that the sound is really kicking in, uh, I, uh, I am very pleased to uh, start this seminar by introducing our guest speaker, which is uh, Dr. Gerald Knaus of the European Stability Initiative. And this is a European think tank. Uh, he will be, be uh, given the opportunity of introducing it more in detail. But this is a think tank which has paid a particular interest to the subject which I just spoke about and has delivered several reports pointing to the magnitude of corruption within the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Under the headline of uh, caviar diplomacy, a subject which I think we can honestly say was established thanks to the reports uh, which was uh, published by the St European Stability Initiative, we can see that several countries, most notably in the Caucasus, have acted in a way which is contrary, runs contrary to the values of the Parliamentary Assembly. And which is something which is uh, very important for us in Sweden. Uh, I stand here not only as a, uh, as a uh, uh, member of parliament for the moderate party and not only as the first deputy speaker of the parliament, but also as the vice chair of the Swedish delegation to the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, and we have, together with many uh, other member states, acted uh, to try and uh, contradict uh, this development uh, and the escalation of the development of corruption which I'm going to talk more about later on. But now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Gerald Knaus. Please, you're more than welcome up here to, to present your case. Thank you. Thank and you. let's give him a hand. Oh, well, first of all, thanks a lot to uh, Tobias Bilström, the Moderate Party, the Foundation, and to all of you for coming here. It's always a pleasure to come to uh, Sweden and to Scandinavia, and I've been here a few times to discuss this issue. Uh, if there's one uh, partner institution, one foundation that has uh, been interested in this for many, many years, it's been the Jarl Halmarsson Foundation. I remember a few years ago already being invited to speak about this. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Gerald Knaus. Um, I am now based in Berlin. I'm director or chairman of a think tank, independent, uh, non-profit. Uh, we, are, we are not lobbyists, we are not advocates. Um, and uh, we've been doing research on this topic almost by coincidence for the last six years. Uh, and if you're interested, I'll say more about this in a second. <laughs> Cover diplomacy, uh, this story is uh, confusing, lots of details, lots of people. I'll try to simplify it, uh, but I look forward to the debate. And I will also point you to our reports where there is a lot more detail about what I'm going to speak about. I mean, let me present a big context. In 1950, this was the ceiling <laughs> in the room in Rome where uh, delegates from uh, Western democracies gathered and agreed on the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in the Palazzo Barberini. What is interesting is not only the importance of the convention, but they did it in a, it's a beautiful ceiling. You see the European symbol which became the, the um, flag of the Council of Europe, the first pan-European institution of democracies, later of the European Union. What they should have perhaps considered is that much of this beautiful painting has been paid for by corruption, because the Council of Europe was meeting in the Barberini Pope's uh, aristocratic palace. But what came out had nothing to do with corruption, but it's opposite. It was a set of 
binding commitments to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, and an unprecedented idea, let's establish a court that sovereign democracies submit themselves to, they ratify the convention, and this court can then enforce in democracies, which are always imperfect, that was the idea, but which aspire to uh, fulfill the commitments they make, that this European Court of Human Rights is, is then the institution to um, safeguard these values. And of course, the Council of Europe created a year before the convention was agreed in 1949, also gave itself an assembly, the Assembly of Parliamentarians, where Sweden and Germany and uh, Spain and Russia and all the member states sent parliamentarians. Uh, and this assembly votes for the judges of the European Court. It's one of the things the assembly does, but it gives you a sense how important it is to the architecture of human rights protection in Europe. Uh, it also votes for the General Secretary of the Council of Europe. It's involved in choosing people for the Anti-Torture Committee, and it does monitoring, reporting, election observation, and other things. It fights corruption. The Council of Europe as an institution uh, with its group of states against corruption, and that has been particularly ironic in the last year. As I met people who work at Greco, and they were tearing their hair out, unofficially, off the record, <laughs> as they were looking across the street, because they are the experts on how to build institutions that are robust against outside influence. And they had to recognize, and they did a pretty tough report recently, that the institution that they are closely associated with, the Council of Europe, had almost no protections in the Parliamentary Assembly against capture. Council of Europe has 47 members. Uh, some are, as you can imagine, um, more interesting when it comes to human rights problems than others. Russia, of course, is the biggest member, but there is Turkey, actually every European country except for Belarus. And in 2001, Azerbaijan joined. And what is interesting is that the president of Azerbaijan today his first international career was in the Council of Europe. He became a vice president of the assembly. His father was then the president of the country. And when he left the Council of Europe in 2003 to become president, he knew how the institution worked. This is very important. He pays close attention, in his, uh, including his senior staff, and uh, this had a consequence. In 2012, we published a report, uh, but perhaps 30 seconds of background. We went to Azerbaijan the first time in 2007, uh, actually, we were then hosted by the Diplomatic Academy, which was run by the uh, uh, uncle of the First Lady of Azerbaijan and the former ambassador to the US, and we presented research and what we did elsewhere. And then we started doing field research in Azerbaijan, but as we were doing research, uh, all of the interesting uh, youth activists, human rights activists, democracy activists we interviewed started getting into trouble and then, of course, arrested and put on trial. Now, we then did a first report on this new generation of dissidents. And as we did this report and published it in 2011, the Facebook generation in Baku, we, we hit upon this paradox that the Council of Europe, of which Azerbaijan had been a member, and which we hadn't followed much before, uh, didn't seem to get more critical as things deteriorated. And as we went back and studied the debates, the resolutions, the election monitoring, uh, this paradox just got bigger and bigger. <laughs> it was incomprehensible at the end to see how as human rights visibly deteriorated, the assessment of Azerbaijan and the Council of Europe seemed to become more and more positive. Now, the solution to this paradox uh, was when we did detailed research in Azerbaijan, and then we had some insight sources, and I still remember those conversations, which were really shocking, where insiders involved in this policy explained to us that yes, this was all done in this way. Deputies are regularly invited, generously paid. This is about big scale corruption. People would be invited to conferences repeatedly, to vacations. They would get expensive gold, silver items, silk carpets worth thousands of euros, drinks, caviar, and substantial amounts of money. There would be blackmail. I mean, the whole package of KGB style influencing slash capturing as a systematic strategy pursued over many, many years. Now, we were then in a dilemma because we couldn't reveal our sources, obviously. We also didn't know if we could believe every detail, so we didn't put names in our report. We just did two things. We said, this is what happens, and I must say that for the last five years, nobody's ever disputed that. Nobody responded and said no. And every MP we talked to, among those we knew was honest and committed and had been there for a long time, had had suspicions. And then we said, we can't tell you who's corrupt, you have to figure that out yourself, but we show you what everyone does. And we de 
researched in detail what MPs said, how they voted, and we asked, well, journalists, other MPs, prosecutors, the media, ask why they do these things. <laughs> there might be perfectly innocent explanations, but probably not. And uh, so we published this report and we called it Caviar Diplomacy. There was a lot of attention in the media, almost no reaction in the Council of Europe. Uh, and a funny reaction in Baku, I, I learned later, because later some emails were leaked, where the key person we refer to as one of the architects of this policy, a member of the Parliamentary Assembly, a rich businessman from Baku, Elkan Suleimanov, and his associates were almost amused. They found it funny <laughs> that somebody had found out how very smart their strategy had been, and they had no complaints or worries at all that this would have an impact on what they did. And they were right. The highlight of cover diplomacy, their great triumphs, came after we wrote about it. For example, in January uh, 2013, a vote on political prisoners in Azerbaijan, record turnout for a vote on a resolution on political on, on individual on human rights. The, the resolution said ensure that there are no cases of political prisoners, refrain from criminalizing expression of views. Uh, it was a very straightforward resolution, backed up by all the research of all the human rights organizations, by a special rapporteur. This is who voted so that it was defeated by 125 to 79. All the Russians turned up and voted for Azerbaijan. All the Turks, all the Spaniards, most Italians, and quite a big part of the delegations from Ukraine, the UK, and France. Now, on the other side were all the Germans who voted, one didn't vote, and all the Swedes. So there was a cross-party consensus in Sweden that there were political prisoners in Azerbaijan. All the Balts also, and this is important, because when we looked at this, we said, if there is going to, come going to be change, it has to come from MPs from these regions. Votes have consequences, and after this, there was a wave of arrests. And to put the finger into the eye of the Council of Europe, Azerbaijan started arresting all the people who had worked with the Council of Europe, like Ilga Mamadov, who ran the School of Politics uh, Council of Europe project in Azerbaijan, he's been in prison since early 2013, right after that vote, and he's still in prison today. And uh, Anna Mamadli, who was the rapporteur, I mean, the, ad the, the advisor to the rapporteur on political prisoners, and one of the leading election observers in Azerbaijan, very courageous, was arrested and put in prison. He was the man who had advised the German rapporteur on political prisoners. When he was put in prison, there was no strong reaction uh, from the Council of Europe. We wrote another report, end of 2013. I think this is one of our most interesting, and I send it to journalists all the time, because it is full of names. A lot of MPs from around Europe going to Azerbaijan to observe elections. And it is amazing, because they're all behaving like the three monkeys. There was the long-term observer mission of the OSCE, ODIA, which had been there for a long time, and which, beyond any doubt, clearly establishes that these elections were like GDR elections. They were fake, they were fraud, they were problematic in every respect. Okay, this is the long-term mission which had a methodology and they really couldn't be bribed. But there were, we counted, 49 other missions. Parliamentary delegations from the European Parliament, from the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, from the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, and from lots of Parliament small private groups. And they all, those 49, all said elections were great. These were good, fine, meeting all the standards. It's like saying, you know, it's, it's raining outside and all these 49 groups said, clearly the sun is shining. And the only experts who actually know anything about the weather and are taking measures of how much rain is falling uh, say, no, it's pouring rain. And this paradox was so obvious. And of course, a lot of this had to do with money. Why did Azerbaijan bother? There was a question we asked ourselves the last few years, and many ask us. Why do they want to manipulate the Council of Europe? And here we come to something we've seen in the last few years in a lot of big democracies, the fight over newspeak. You cannot shame behavior if you, you lose your language. And if autocracy is the same as democracy, if stolen elections are also free and fair elections, and if dissidents are hooligans, if you don't know anymore what is black and what is white, you lose your language. And if Azerbaijan is criticized by Swedish parliamentarians or by Human Rights Watch or by Amnesty, all Ilham Aliyev needed to do in the last few years was to say, yeah, but the Council of Europe is of a different opinion and it's the leading human rights institution in the world. So uh, shaming becomes impossible if you lose your language and that's why Azerbaijan invent invested so much effort. And that was the result. The Commission of Human Rights, another person who was very outspoken, 
constantly said that everybody he's talking to who cares about human rights is arrested. At the same time, Azerbaijan had the chairmanship of the parliamentary assembly and was chairing meetings on sports and youth and religious tolerance. At the same time, arresting many of its leading people. Uh, Anna Mamadli received the Václav Havel Prize from the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly while he was in jail and Azerbaijan had the chairmanship. It couldn't be more absurd. And Khadija Ismailova, a leading investigative journalist, but also activist for human rights. We worked with her translating a list of political prisoners. She worked on this in Baku. She knew that she would be arrested. She was arrested. She was in jail for two years. Uh, she is now still not allowed to leave the country. So after four years of writing, we thought nothing will ever change. But then what happened was that uh, an interesting turn of event led to all the confirmation with hard evidence of what we before could only point to as a pattern, but couldn't prove. And so we published this in Kave Diplomacy Part 2 in December last year. And it has to do with this man again. This is a letter that an Italian, prominent in the Parliamentary Assembly, wrote to Elkan Suleimanov in spring 2011. Dear Elkan, thank you for everything. That was after a trip to Baku. I have discovered a very interesting country. Our friendship is certainly growing. Thanks, your gifts are very tasty and very precious three exclamation marks. This is spring 2011 and that's how it works. You first get invited and you get some gifts. Gold, whatever. This is the man who wrote this letter, Luca Volonte, who was at that time the head of the biggest political group, the EPP group, in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, an Italian politician. And this shows you that it wasn't about party groups at all. He also wrote in December 2012 to the Azerbaijanis, we need to name a lot of our friends. This is for the debate on political prisoners. And so you have somebody from the far right in Italy, uh, somebody who is a former communist who was a socialist in Poland, uh, a liberal in Britain, another conservative in Britain, a liberal from Spain. And of course, we need to stress their opinion in fa favor of Pedro. Pedro is Pedro Agramont, who made the best career in those years and is now the president of the Parliamentary Assembly. So uh, there was coordination between all these friends of Azerbaijan in all these emails, which we only got to see because of this. There were all these transfers of money. And an Italian, uh, this is fantastic. I mean, thanks to the Italians, they did their job when regulators elsewhere didn't. They noticed that Luca Volante received all this money <laughs> and they asked questions and he couldn't explain why he received 100,000 uh, euros, then 220,000 euros. This is all before the vote on political prisoners. It started then. And then afterwards, 180,000 euros and then regularly 100,000 euros a month for almost two years until, in fact, the prosecutors uh, started to get involved and then it stopped. So he got 2.4 million euros. And uh, they asked him why. At first he said uh, agricultural advice. <laughs> then he said... It was political advice on democratization, but what he didn't dispute was that this came from Azerbaijan. And then the prosecutors found the emails in his office like this. After the vote on political prisoners, he writes to Elkan Suleimanov, who is still today a member of the assembly. Hi, did you forget about me after, you after your victory? And Elkan Suleimanov says, no, you are my devoted friend forever. He was actually very pushy and the money kept flowing. He gave an interview with Rai, which the Italian investigative, uh, uh, I mean, one of the TV stations of the investigative format, where he explained that the agreement he had with uh, Suleimanov was for 10 years, a million a year, so for 10 million. You know, we're not talking about small sums of money. And, um, and he received it to for, he for providing advice, which I personally provided to Suleimanov as president of his NGO. What is amazing is that when this was known in autumn 2016, that one MP pays another MP the president of the parliamentary assembly still thought there's no need to investigate anything. This is all fine. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, Pedro Agramont uh, kept arguing that the problem was one of NGOs like ESI or Transparency who kept insisting and uh, writing about this. And this is, of course, the most interesting bit, how the money reached Volante. So this should make you suspicious if the previous emails haven't. Via the Marshall Islands, you know, there is a a company, via companies of Danske Bank, an account of Danske Bank in Estonia, and then via companies in the United Kingdom. And this is interesting because when this came out, and we wrote about it and made it all public, uh, journalists started looking what else was flowing through these companies. And they were very successful. Media started exploring the connections. 
And just a few weeks ago, the story of the Azerbaijani laundromat pointed to 2.9 billion that went through these companies just over a few years. There was more before, more later. It's just a part of the story. They haven't even started to discover everything. And now journalists can put together the pieces. All these are people who appeared in our report for what they did and said. It turns out Steph Goris was a member of the Parliamentary Assembly from Belgium, a liberal. Then he became a paid lobbyist afterwards. Okay, that was not a secret. And he's still going to these sessions in Strasbourg. Paul Wille was another Belgian liberal who was uh, heading an election monitoring mission to Azerbaijan, said it was brilliant in 2010. He also went to Kazakhstan and other countries. He later, Belgian press now writes, became a lobbyist for Azerbaijan when he left. And Alain Destex, another Belgian liberal, was first setting up an election monitoring private company with Steph Goris, <laughs> registered in his house, that received money through another lobbyist through this laundromat from Azerbaijan. For many years, he goes to Azerbaijan, he says elections are fine. I mean, these are expensive operations. It's registered in his house. And then he joins PACE. And what would happen? Well, you can guess it. He becomes the rapporteur and political prisoners of the Parliamentary Assembly for Azerbaijan. I mean, it's just astonishing. <laughs> it was so transparent. And this pattern of having a lead person in some of the key delegations was repeated in other delegations. Pedro Agramon, there were other Spaniards he tried to build up. Uh, and of course, he was then, throughout this period, first elected head of the EPP and then head of the Parliamentary Assembly. This man, a German who was chairman of two committees in the Parliamentary Assembly, later becomes an official lobbyist. And through his bank account, money flows to the stacks and his private uh, outfit and to another German MP, uh, who has just the week before the elections admitted that she received at least 15,000 euros. So what now? Let me come to what can be done or what has been done. Can the Council of Europe be saved? This is why we need it. Because the people who created it in 1949, Churchill, or the French resistance and then uh, a resistance fighter and then a uh, minister of justice of De Gaulle, Pierre Ritaitken, they said we need something that is an early warning system when democracies go wrong. A spiritual union, that was, was what it was supposed to be. Well, now we had a group of MPs across party groups, a German here, a social democrat, a Christian democrat from the Netherlands, and many others, and at the heart of it were Swedes. I don't put up pictures because you know them all, but Tobias and, uh, Tobias, uh, and Kerstin uh, Lindgren, Tobias Bilstrom and Kerstin Lindgren, and others, and the whole delegation, in fact, played a key role, as did all the Nordic countries coming up with a first resolution already in January uh, of the Scandinavians, the Bolts and, and Iceland, saying we want uh, clarity. And this coalition, which was only really formed earlier this year, uh, started having a real impact. Structural change, suddenly everyone found out that the Code of Conduct of PACE only had two sanctions for massive violations. I mean, any gift over 200 euros is a violation of the Code of Conduct. But the only sanctions were a temporary deprivation of the right to speak, or the right to sign an amendment. And the only person who can decide this is one person, Pedro Agramont, the president. Uh, we called it the FIFA of human rights, because FIFA has more control mechanisms than the parliamentary assembly. So this is the key. Now there is an investigative body that has started to look into this. More and more stories are coming out. Now newspapers around Europe are writing about it in the last few months. There is much more to discover. And as I tell the journalists, just take our old reports and look and see what everybody did. Not everyone who defended Azerbaijan was paid for it. Almost everybody. So just see if you can find uh, more information, because of course you need the evidence. The key is to pay attention, and that is my key lesson from all of this. If we leave institutions to themselves and don't care enough, if the press, if parliament parliamentary leaderships, this is so, that's so important about countries saying the Council of Europe matters to us. So we allow our MPs to go to the sessions, to be there, because the Russians were always there. And the good luck was this year they weren't there <laughs> because of Crimea. Uh, they, they, there had been a complicated dispute. So they couldn't actually help Azerbaijan defend itself. One idea we have, and I end with this, is that the EU should help PACE to make shaming more effective. For example, do something that all these autocracies in the East do. Um, put some people who are responsible for these human rights violations against dissidents, who torture people, who run prisons, on travel bans. I mean, this is very straightforward and create a commission for this that recommends it. And then have once a year, instead of the Nobel Prize ceremony, a rotten apple ceremony, where you present the eight most important human rights violators, because amazingly, not a single person from Azerbaijan, despite all these violations in the last 15 years, has ever received a travel ban for human rights reasons, not one. 
The core lesson is we need institutions because everyone can be misled, even all democracies. So like Ulysses, listening to the sirens, whether it's caviar or money or a career, we need to tie ourselves to the mast of functioning institutions and controls. If we have those, then we can protect ourselves against temptation. Here is where all the reports are, and I'm looking forward to the debate and any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was actually going to, to, to ask you to come back to the stage and, and stand here with ah, me. Yeah, 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 because I'm going to ask you a few questions as we go along. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say that um, this is, of course, a, a in so many ways, a very horrible story. But there are, as you said, at the end of the day, there, there is some sunshine because you can see that there are forces within the parliamentary assembly who wants to work in a different way. And you can also see that there, there is a coalition forming up. And the important thing is to get, keep, keep things going. Um, I personally, when I became a member of the Parliamentary Assembly in 2016, I wasn't aware of the scale of this. Uh, but I got thrown into it quite brutally <laughs> when uh, we made a suggestion from the Swedish delegation together with some of the other Nordic delegations about uh, the, um, an exhibition being hosted uh, about political prisoners uh, in Azerbaijan uh, at the foyer, the foyer of, of the building. Now, this is quite a normal process. I mean, so it's happening all the time that you make exhibitions about things. It is minority rights and it is cultural exhibitions, etc. <coughs> so we approach, approached the presidency with this, this uh, request. Uh, and it was being brought up and then it was turned down by the president who said that, no, he wouldn't allow this to, to, to happen. And we asked why and we got some very cryptic answers <laughs> back. And uh, so we requested a meeting with him. Uh, so I went there because our chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Jonas Gunnarsson, couldn't go, together with representatives of, of uh, uh, the Norwegian, the Danish, the Finnish delegation, and the Estonian. And we sat down, and um, Mr. Pedro Agramont uh, tried to sort of circumvent the subject. But at the end, he said that he couldn't allow it to happen because of the uh, conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia it would cause too much disturbance to allow such an exhibition, which was, of course, complete nonsense. <laughs> and I've spoken with, with, with Gerald about this before, because w how enough this was going to be, be about political prisoners in Azerbaijan, where is the connection to Armenia in all that? As a matter of fact, if you were to bring Ilgo Mamadov out of prison and ask him some questions on, let's say, the subject of Nagorno-Karabakh, he's very likely to take the opinion of the Azeri government on that particular subject. And I don't have anything to say about that. But this was about human rights violations. So from that moment, I started to, get got I, I, I started to be suspicious about this. And then, as your reports came out, it only fueled the whole, mm. the whole debate. And finally, this spring, we saw, you didn't mention this in your, in your presentation, but I'm going to, to do it mm. because I think it also shows how rotten the whole presidency of, of the, the, the parliamentary assembly has gotten. When you can see the president of the assembly traveling on you know, a Russian state flight, a state plane, to Damascus and being pictured together with Russian generals as a Ru at a Russian Air Force base, and then afterwards saying, oh, I was only going back, uh, going to, to Syria and to Damascus in my capacity as a Spanish senator. It has, has nothing to do with my, me being president of the parliamentary <laughs> assembly at all. And more importantly, the two men, which also made the journey to Damascus together with him, should be mentioned. Because you mentioned them in your presentation. They were Jordi Zucla, who is the group leader of the Alde group, the liberal group, and Monsieur de Stex, the now former Belgian senator who had to step down following the, the uh, things you spoke about, the, the, the allegations on corruption. So these three men went there, and they were also, uh, they were photographed together with Mr. Srutsky, who was a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and who is the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Russian State Duma. So you all see that it is not just about Azerbaijan. This goes much further beyond. And I would say, you know, speaking in front of this assembly, which is sitting here today, that we need to put a stop to this before this whole wave will take over 
and we will see forces who want to see these institutions collapse. This is, of course, at the end of a, of a line. This is what they want to happen. We want, need to stop this before it, it reaches that point. Um, this committee of inquiry, uh, also uh, this question about registration duty, it is inconceivable in many ways that uh, as, a, as a minister in, in Sweden, you have to register every single gift that you receive. That has to be put down so that media and journalists and everybody can see exactly what you have received down to the value of 350 Swedish crowns, which is the established number. But as you said, <laughs> when you become a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, you don't need to do very much registration at all. And nobody did. And nobody <laughs> did. And there are, as a matter of fact, no full register as such. It is, in, you know, incomplete. Nobody has really bothered for years to do such a such a, uh, an account. And this I find, you know, amazing in, in so many ways, given that there are so many opportunities for corruption to occur when you don't have a, a proper registration duty for, for MPs. So what I would like to turn to now is what will happen next. Well, there has been a committee of inquiry being put up by three prominent, you know, it consists of three prominent judges, one from Britain, one from France, and one from Sweden. Uh, Miss Elisabeth Führer, who used to be our uh, judge at the European Court of Human Rights, and has also been the ombudsman of the Swedish Parliament, and who is, uh, you know, a very, very well uh, known lawyer and, and defender of human rights. I think that these three uh, judges certainly will look into matters when it comes to what has happened in the past. We will see, hopefully, people being brought to justice for what they have done within the, the system. But more importantly, we need to look to the future. Because what this committee also should do, and I hope that they will do, is of course to present suggestions to the Parliamentary Assembly about how to change our rules and regulations so that we can prevent this from happening. It is not just a question about dragging people to justice who deserve to, they certainly deserve to, 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 to uh, get what, what, uh, what uh, they deserve, but I would like to point out that it is also the future which is, which is important. Uh, and I would like to turn to you now, Gerald, and hear what, what, what are the thoughts about ESI for, for the protection about these institutions in the future? Have you done some thoughts about mm -hmm. this, and, and could you please tell the audience about it? Thank you. Well, I think let's just take a few of the areas where the, the problems were biggest. I mean, one is election monitoring. One of the things I never understood was that it was possible for years to have PACE delegations going and observe elections. And in every delegation, there were honest people, and they usually were the ones who were most shocked by what they saw. Mm. But because of the maneuvering and the strength of this coalition in PACE, a lot of the heads of these delegations surprisingly always found everything was fine. But what is amazing is that we had a methodology with ODIA, the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Warsaw, with long-term observers. And when there was a discrepancy between what the long-term observers found with a lot of data and the opposite of a parliamentary delegation, there was no mechanism to say, let's reconcile this. I mean, perhaps, look, let's have a committee, let's have a hearing, and, okay, here is, let's invite the experts, what they saw, and let's invite the parliamentarians, why they say it was fine. Mm -hmm. In fact, this never happened. And it raises a question, I think, parliamentary observers for elections can be very useful if they are part of a package and coordinate closely with the uh, experts, the long-term observers, because of course, if you turn up in GDR elections three days before they turn out, you might say they are well administered, but you know you don't actually see much, especially if you are uh, if you have incentives. So one thing is we need a serious debate about the future of election observations mm. structurally, because that is a, a, an entry door. The second is that the, the Council of Europe was designed, and this is now raising a big issue as a body for um, incomplete democracies, or I mean for, for, for imperfect democracies, and all democracies are imperfect. I, I mean, it's supposed to help us with our European democracies too. When you have open autocracies as members, and there's no response for a long, long time, and Azerbaijan is just one, I mean, Russia is obviously for a long time been the other one, then this has consequences. I mean, the 18 Russians voting, and it was I think a lot of what happened this year would also would not have happened as easily if there would have been the 18 Russians present. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to raise a question. Russia has now put black blackmails the Council of Europe because it said when Pedro Agramont was put under pressure to resign for all of this and his trip to Syria, it, it said we will no longer pay the Council of Europe dues. We will not pay our contribution. We are freezing it. Unless the Council of Europe and the Parliamentary Assembly give in to our requests and what they request is that there should be no sanctions at all in the future. The possibility of sanctioning MPs should be abolished. The Council of Europe cannot give up on this. I mean, if it does, it's dead. <laughs> so we have a big issue coming up on how to deal with Russia and with clear autocracies in the future. This uh, is can now no longer be avoided. And the third issue has a lot to do with organization of the Democrats. What, uh, what we saw in the last few months was really restored my faith in European democracy because what one could see is people who care about corruption and the rule of law and human rights across groups and across countries coming together. But before that, they were mainly, mainly organized within each political party group, which makes a lot of sense normally in all political institutions. But in the Council of Europe, it weakened them tremendously because in each party group, as long as Azerbaijan made sure that on the right vote for committee chairman or faction leader, enough of its apologists were present, they began to control groups. I mean, the EPP was led by a succession of people that, in hindsight, don't look like the best choice. Although there were <laughs> lots of EPP people from across Europe, particularly Northern Europe, who, who care deeply about human rights, to find a way to, to weaken that through more cooperation, basically among the Democrats which should be the majority, and I'm convinced it is. But that requires parliaments, like the German parliament, to make it easy for delegates from countries that care to actually go and attend. Mm -hmm. Because often German parliamentary sessions are at the same time as a PACE session, so the people who are busy and are very good parliamentarians don't have time <laughs> to be in Strasbourg because they're in Berlin. And the end result is, who turns up? The people from countries that have lots of time and lots of interest. And that weakens the cause of human rights. So there are some structural problems. But my last point is for civil society, the media, NGOs, think tanks, foundations, just pay attention. I, 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 what I've learned with this story is that any institution can be corrupted if nobody looks closely. Because then the right people will be in a minority, the, the honest people. And if we don't care, uh, and so now what we are want to do and I recommend is just go through all the institutions and study them one by one torture committee, I mean, all of it, how to make them as robust and as strong as possible. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I, I can say that I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you say. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is, A, that I think that the, um, how should I say, the, the success story, that is the European Union, has also been part of the problem of the Council of Europe mm. and most notably its parliamentary assembly. Because as the EU moved along and got more and more members and became more and more important institution, the Council of Europe, how should we say, was, uh, well, was sidelined in, mm. in many ways. It didn't, it didn't appear as important as it, as it truly is and, and, and should be. And I think that we should, should learn from this. Uh, you shouldn't underestimate the need to be uh, vigilant when it comes to the, um, you know, uh, as you say, the, the protection of those in, in institutions in the future. And particularly with the enlargement process being going on, I mean, we all know that in order to become a member of the European Union, you first have to pass the threshold of becoming a member of the Council of Europe. But if the Council of Europe is not a functioning body, and with functioning I mean that it is actually, you know, doing the work it should, do, it should be doing, then the European Union at the end of the day also runs some s severe risks. So I mm. think that, you know, the, you, you, you mentioned in your presentation the need for the EU to stretch out a hand. Of course, there should be a separation. The EU is not the same as the Council of Europe, and no, nor should it be. But the EU could definitely lend a hand mm. to, to the protection. I think it should do so. I should also say about the need <coughs> to build a coalition that from our part in Sweden, we have been very active in trying to bring this to the attention also of those who appoint people to the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, mm -hmm. to the Council of Europe. So this spring we uh, got all the speakers of the Nordic Baltic countries to sign a letter which was sent to the, uh, to the uh, President of the Parliamentary Assembly calling for an independent investigation, which became the inquiry, into the allegations of corruption. And I think this is important also that speakers take their responsibility. Some speakers sometimes feel that they should, they are a bit reluctant because they feel that 
you know, maybe they sh they, the, sometimes the constitution prevents them from being politically active. But I say that regardless of how the constitution is written, of course, if you appoint people and every parliamentary assembly who appoint, you know, if in, in states who are, who are members of the, of the Council of Europe sends people to the parli parliamentary assembly, then of course you should be interested in questions about allegations of corruption. It only stands to reason. So I don't understand those who, who feel that they shouldn't be part of this. And I think that definitely all speakers should sooner or later state what they believe is, is uh, the right course uh, mm. when it comes to this. Um, also, I have a, a, a question to you also. Um, you have now written two reports on caviar diplomacy. The third one, <laughs> is that going to be a third one? What subject do you, are, are you now thinking of if you if I look at the presentation that you made. Well, w when it comes to discovering who was involved in the past, I think the best the best instrument is, is now media. Mm. I mean, in the recent weeks, we had Le Monde, The Guardian, Süddeutsche Zeitung, big papers in the Baltic states, in, 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 in Denmark, do investigations. So mm. we no longer need to do that. Mm. We gladly provide what we know. Um, and prosecutors, I think that that was crucial in Italy, that prosecutors started looking into the case of Volante because they could do a search and find the emails. Mm. But I think what, what is important is if we want to save the Council of Europe to build on the positive momentum, to also give it an agenda again. Mm. Mm. So uh, what, what we want to push for and, and, and find allies, uh, because in the end it all depends. It doesn't matter what we write. We saw that for five <laughs> years. It depends on MPs <laughs> who have the mandate, mm. who, can, who can do something that what an agenda might be for 2019, which is 70 years of the Council of Europe. Mm. It's only two years from now. Mm. And to, for example, to take up the issue of political prisoners and say the Council of Europe should be a place where there are no political prisoners. Mm -hmm. How do we get there? We have a definition, uh, but if, of course, we have rapporteurs on this who are dubious from day one because they have a long record. This is another thing in hearings. Mm. I think one should ask people and check their record on what they've said or did before. But if one defines that we want to have strong mechanisms, and there are a lot of ideas one can have uh, to, 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 to be more robust on, on political prisoners, because this is a, the core issue of human rights. Um, and uh, secondly, on, on anti-torture, uh, finding ways to be more effective. I mean, making the anti-torture committee, which is another Council of Europe body, mm. more effective, that reports don't come out for Azerbaijan years later. I mean, we shouldn't tolerate this. We should press them or have consequences. And finally, be much, much better. And this is what we're thinking about a lot and how to create media interest or think tank interest or academics interest. There is no good book on the history of the Council of Europe that doesn't, isn't written by lawyers and looks just at the law, but that looks at the story, the people, you know, dramatic stories. If we don't have narratives, if we don't see the battles, <laughs> then people will not understand why it matters. But when it comes to the Council of Europe and Turkey, the Council of Europe and Russia, the Council of Europe and all democracies. The best book on this, and I close on this, is a, a very good book on the origin of the Council of Europe, which shows us how important it could be. Britain was one of the driving forces behind the Convention on Human Rights. And Britain drove this, and they had this, and they were very confident, and it was a great thing, and then it was used against them. Why? Because at that time, Cyprus was a British colony. And in Cyprus, Britain violated human rights right, left, and center. Massive detentions, more people in jail, proportionally than now in Turkey. Uh, executions, executions of people just for running around with broken guns. Uh, total control of the media. I mean, massive repression. And in theory, the convention applied. So Greece took Britain uh, to the Council of Europe and said this can't work. And Britain had to react. Now, this shows us that even democracies might be tempted mm. to go in the wrong direction. And Britain did react. I mean, there was a debate in the Foreign Office uh, where uh, people said to each other, shall we just leave the Council of Europe? And then one of them said, we can't, we created it. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> just three years ago, four years ago. <laughs> and of course, France had the same problem in Algeria and decided to solve it by not ratifying the convention until the 1970s. So all the great French creators of that convention then decided it didn't apply to Algeria. I mean, it couldn't apply because it wasn't ratified. So this, we need it for all democracies as well. Mm -hmm. But we need to see these stories, how it can be useful. And, and for this, we first need to see it, and that's perhaps a good thing of this scandal, that people know it exists, they know there are good MPs fighting for good causes, and if Azerbaijan takes it so seriously, then <coughs> so should the Democrats. 
That's that's uh, very good finishing words. But um, I would li now like to open the floor for any questions that there are. So uh, if anybody would like to uh, ask for the floor, we have a microphone up here, which uh, Jonathan Olsen will bring to you. So please wave your hand. Yes, we start with the lady and then Mr. Kjellsborg. Thank you, and thank you for uh, extremely interesting presentations. My question is to you, because I was, would like to think what your opinion is on the Swedish reaction to all of this. Hmm. Well, I can be very brief and say that it has been strong, and it has been very, very coherent. Uh, there is, uh, you know, within the delegation, there is full support both for the inquiry. Uh, also, I mentioned the letter which uh, we asked the speaker to, to sign and also take the initiative to, to get the other speakers on board. And Sweden has been active because we were a founding uh, member of, of the Council of Europe uh, and we are also a country which believes very strongly and has believed in, in the Council of Europe. I also represent uh, a, a party, the moderate party, who has hold held throughout the years several important positions, you know, whether they have been of one or another political affiliation doc doesn't really matter. But we have always been very interested in the activities of the Council of Europe and its parliamentary assembly. And now when we see these threats, we need to, to you know, stand up for the, or to take a stand <laughs> for the values which we believe in and, and which are inherent in, 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 uh, in this uh, uh, system of the Council of Europe. I w I'm, I'm, I'm very glad for your response. Mm -hmm. There's also, al also thinking about how, how has Swedish media and Swedish NGOs and the Swedish public reacted to this, because I honestly haven't read that much about it, but maybe that's my fault. No, I, I'm not going to blame you at all. As a matter of fact, I would like to come back to the, the issue I mentioned before, the confusion between the European <coughs> Union and the Council <coughs> of Europe. The mere fact that sometimes people, even then when, the, when they are referring to <coughs> the to the European Council, you know, the meetings of the heads of governments and states, they say, oh, today the Council of Europe met, or today the European Council, they, they, they confuse, you know, the, 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 mm. the, the, the terms. Uh, and this has, of course, been detrimental to the understanding of the, of the Council of Europe in the, in the media to some extent, but you have forgotten it. And this is part of the problem. However, this whole seminar, which we are um, holding here today in Stockholm, the work of Gerhard and, and others, uh, I think it's going to change this. And the, the fact that uh, newspapers such as The Guardian now runs regular big stories on this corruption scandal and, and about the threats, I think in the fullness of time perhaps will also catch the attention of the Swedish journalists. That's, that's our intention at least. Please, Mr. Bertolt, you have the floor. Thank you for a most forceful and efficient uh, presentation. Two questions. Uh, first, uh, to what extent did you feel that the other organs of the Council of Europe, uh, the Council of Ministers and the staff, the Secretary General and his staff, uh, were helpful or could do anything or were in, in some way um, uh, working in the same direction as you were, uh, you were indicating? My second question concerns another European organization uh, which is dealing with um, election uh, monitoring, the OSCE. Uh, did you find, or are you looking also at that organization, and have you found similarities between your investigations in the Council of Europe into the OSCE? Fritz? Um, well, I think what this whole crisis exposed is a very big, not only structural, but cultural problem in Strasbourg, which is the idea, and it really is, I think, a legacy of the optimism of the 90s, when there was this sense that democracy is advancing and we can bring in new members and they will try to behave and emulate the democracies. And we didn't realize that they were turning the tables on us, that Azerbaijan changed the Council of Europe more than the Council of Europe changed Azerbaijan. And this optimism gave rise to a culture of basically not wanting controversy or not wanting much controversy. Sometimes we have controversy in, in Strasbourg, I mean, but usually it's for country or for issues that are not covering the Council of Europe, you know, CIA black sites or Kosovo organ trading, or Kosovo was not a member. Uh, you know, on Russia, we had with Crimea and the war in, 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 in Georgia, <coughs> they did, there were two controversies. But overall, the culture in the Committee of Ministers is consensual. Let's discuss and let's not try to put things to the vote. I, I find this problematic 
when the challenges are so obvious and for the last five years uh, touch the credibility of the institution itself. I think it's good that in the Committee of Ministers there has been strong backing now to this in Committee of Inquiry, but I think the culture needs to change. I mean, the Council of Europe can only attract interest of anybody when there are debates that are worth following, and that requires controversial debates, confronting those who pretend to pay lip service to the, uh, to the European Convention. So I think one thing that I also hope for is that member states represented in the Committee of Ministers also say we need the Council of Europe. It's an important tool to promote democracy and defend it in Europe, where it is challenged in many of EU member states too, <laughs> specifically on, on freedom of speech, independence of the courts, NGOs. I mean, we have challenges in Europe, but especially in the member states in the East. Uh, we will become more active. I think that hasn't really happened. I mean, the Committee of Ministers has, has watched this and hasn't organized. And again, it requires organization of a few countries, I hope, for example, that the, the Nordic countries, the Benelux, Germany, Switzerland, a few of who care, come together, Austria, and push. Uh, the Secretariat has also been much too quiet in the last few years. I mean, the, the General Secretary General is voted, is elected by the Assembly. So um, that means th it directly affects the credibility of the Secretariat, indirectly, because the Assembly votes. And if there is a sense that the votes in the assembly are controlled by a, a coalition that can mobilize huge turnouts every time there is a vote um, and that controls a large part of the bureau two years ago, I mean, which is the governing body. And this was all strategic. I mean, if I, I, when, when you, once you knew all these people, you could realize, and once we knew the background, you could realize how, you know, the committee chairmanships and party group chairmanships were just, this was organized so that there was always a, a slight majority in the bureau for what I call the caveat coalition. And if, if you see all of this, I think the Secretary General should have spoken out earlier. He did this year. I mean, Mr. Jagland has spoken out this year, has supported all this. But he should have done it earlier. I mean, I think what he should do now is really press for a deep reform. Because otherwise, the story of cover diplomacy will, will be the big story of his time as Secretary General. And it's not his fault. But he also didn't do anything. And in that sense, it's his responsibility. Uh, I hope he can take the lead and propose lots of changes now to make something like this impossible. And I think the big test will be how, uh, how the Secretariat also interacts with Russia. Because, of course, Russia pays a part of the, the bill. And there's a big threat. You might have to cut resources if you want to credibly negotiate with Russia and say we will not be blackmailed. I mean, you might have to cut your expenses. Mm -hmm. Will there be pressure to say, no, no, let's give up on our standards <laughs> because we want to keep the budget intact? I think that's an issue that will define the future of the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, OSCE, very quickly, the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE, in all our reports, these delegations to Azerbaijan are you know, as bad as those by the Council of Europe. And I, 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 I know some of you here in this room know some people in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe that have been as outspoken apologists as consistently, regularly and often. And you have to ask the question what their motive was. Uh, so I think there too, there was a battle between the professionals, the ODIA in Warsaw, that, that really, they, uh, people tried to corrupt them. I know from inside stories and couldn't because they had a methodology. You know, you can't bribe long-term observers because they all work with templates and there are lots of them and they, it, it doesn't work. I mean, this is a good lesson, how to be robust by just having rules and procedures and clarity and transparency. But <coughs> the parliamentary assembly was always disputing in Azerbaijan the findings of their own professional long-term observers. With the argument, there was a British liberal, Mike Hancock, who had to resign later for a big scandal and who was always an Azerbaijan apologist. Who, who kept saying, we are the elected people, we know how to observe elections. You know, these bureaucrats don't know. And this argument, amazingly, for 10 years was taken uh, as, as acceptable. So yes, there's a story in the OECE to be investigated too. Just to add perhaps briefly that there is one man though who deserves some credit in this, and this is of course the Secretary General to the Parliamentary Assembly, Mr. Yes. Savicki. He has been doing what a, a good Secretary General should be doing, namely to give advice, but also to hold his ground when people try to challenge what, you, what, what, what is obviously, you know, the correct interpretation of the rules and regulations. And in all this mess, 
about Mr. Agamund and his behavior, he has been as straight as, a, as an arrow. Uh, so if there is one man who, who really deserves a, a medal of bravery, because it has taken a lot, I think, to stand up against all these forces within the parliamentary assembly, it is Mr. Savitsky, and, and that, should be, that should be mentioned, I think. Because he's also elected. So, you know, there, it matters exactly. that the Council of Europe, that the parliamentary assembly is seen as that you trust it, because it elects a lot of important positions. Mm. True. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Gerald. That was a <coughs> great presentation. Um, I um, I see caviar diplomacy um, and um, many other examples we see, such as um, uh, authoritarian states manipulating social media uh, as an uh, uh, as a manifestation that authoritarian states have learned to work the system in their favor. Uh, bribing, manipulating, social media manipulation. And we see it not only in, uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, we see it now in, in, in many other places. And I think it's a threat to open, tolerant, democratic societies. Do you feel from your work, uh, which I think is sh sheds light on one aspect of how authoritarian states uh, are capable of manipulating the system, uh, the, the existing system, do you feel that open, tolerant democracies are ready to confront these threats, um, such what Russia is doing in supporting uh, far-right parties in Europe, Turkey, now what we see with uh, Mr. Trump, Brexit, Poland, Hungary. So you see a real organized th uh, threat against open, tolerant, liberal societies. And I think caviar diplomacy puts uh, the spotlight on one specific uh, example, which is great. But I think it's part of a larger picture. Now, my question is, do you feel open, tolerant, democratic societies are ready and capable of confronting this threat? Thank you. Please. Uh, well, one, one thing that, as we did this research, that struck me, and the question that emerged with my colleagues, was that this is also a security risk. Because if you, if, if you have a number of, a, a few that tens, dozens of people each year who are members of national parliaments. Some are being caught up, become blackmailable because they've received gifts or they've been trapped. I mean, there have been traps. Uh, lots of, you know, stories going around the Council of Europe of, you know, prostitutes knocking at hotel doors and, you know, trying to find all the old methods of trying to uh, create dependencies. And then, of course, if you get money, you are... And if this isn't just knowledge that it really stays in Baku but spreads... You know, if you look at the emails of Mr. Volonte, he refers to meetings between Elkan Suleimanov and the leader of the Russian delegation in Baku to discuss how to the next steps. Then I was wondering, isn't that also an issue of, of our security? Because you have a, large, a growing number of people who can be blackmailed in the future because we don't have enough robust institutions. But what is interesting is that uh, political culture and institutions matter. The inside information we got from uh, when we start when we did this research early on uh, was that there, you know you, you can find people that are weak in every country, but the systems are different, and what is tolerated is different. Mm. And so there was a clear concentration on some countries rather than others. <laughs> and this was conscious. Um, I, had, I had somebody say that uh, we don't try to bribe the Swiss and the Swedes. This was in 2012. And I found this very striking. And then it turned out that there was actually a Swedish apologist who was a lobbyist after he was in the Council of Europe. And I was told, yeah, yeah, but he was that rare breed. He did it only after he left the Council of Europe because he believed it. <laughs> you know, he defended us because of Karabakh, not because we bribed him. And I thought, well, that's very interesting. So we, we can't assume that everybody who defends Azerbaijan received money. But it's also interesting that... Mm -hmm. You know, they are from Baku, this was seen as, as, you know, some countries, and I think it has a lot to do with the political culture, but also with the control. So w what can we do? It's a tug of, you know, it's like a, a wrestling game, and Democrats just need to be putting as much energy and effort and imagination and work into it and risk as the other side. This was easy for Azerbaijan. Elkan Suleimanov had it easy. <laughs> You know, there was no pushback. It was almost tr patently transparent. Mm. But if Germany, if Scandinavia, if France, if the serious countries push back, 
there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to take back our institutions, mm. as the last few months have shown. And you're right, it's the tip of an iceberg. Mm. It's, it's not just Azerbaijan and it's not just the Council of Europe. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerald. Well, this was to be a lunch seminar and uh, what the appointed lunch hour between 12 and 13 is almost at an end. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all who appeared here today uh, and listen to, to Gerald and to myself. Uh, on behalf also of the Jarl Jarmason Foundation, uh, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, is the International Bureau and the International Foundation of, of the uh, Moderate Party of Sweden. Uh, and uh, this has been done in close cooperation with them. Uh, and uh, I would like to, uh, to offer them a sincere thanks for hosting us and providing us with all the uh, techno technology uh, which made this possible. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you here at another time at another seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.